you, Lord. Scripture this morning is Acts 15, verses 1 through 4. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, to whom they reported everything God had done through them. It's important for us to hear that today as we continue our study through Acts 15. I was working at a church in Chesapeake several years ago, and many of the churches got together on, uh, to hold a Good Friday service, and pastors would take turns preaching. We had a marvelous time, so the next year we decided to invite more, and we asked the pastor that was at the church right across the street from us, and he refused with these words, unless you're baptized in my church, you're going to hell. How would you react? <laughs> That's just about what we did, and he wouldn't have anything to do with the rest of us. It was a moment a little bit like that in that church in Antioch that day. As we come to it, it's still very early in church history, and there were two main big churches, if you will, the church in Jerusalem that was made up mostly of Jews who believed in Jesus. It was led by James, Jesus' brother, and the apostles when they weren't traveling. And then there was a church in Antioch made up mostly of non-Jews, Gentiles, that is, pastored by Paul and Barnabas. There are big questions in this that need to be answered. Some of the questions are identified. Do new believers, men, have to be circumcised to be accepted by God? And a second question is raised later on. Do all believers have to follow Jewish law? There are also those questions that go unspoken. If you've ever been a part of a family argument, there's the stuff you talk about, and there's the stuff that you don't talk about, um, but, and, and, and it will come to impact any family disagreement. And both are actually part of that argument, even if they're not spoken aloud. Well, there's some of that stuff here as well. The Jewish part of the church was trying to figure out how the Gentiles fit into the people of God. They thought the Gentiles would come to know God when Israel's kingdom was restored as a worldwide kingdom and the Messiah would sit on the throne of David. They had no frame of reference for a church in which Jews and Gentiles were equal after all, the Jews were part of God's chosen people, and the law was given to them as a gift so they'd know how to live in relationship with the holy God. All that's in the background as these words, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses, are thrown out of the church at Antioch. Now the question that's really at stake, and the main reason it's so important to us, is how are we really saved? Is it through belief in Jesus? Is it through obedience to the law? You may have heard it referred to as the difference between law and grace. And a second really important question here is, how does the church determine God's will? Now, this is the first major dispute in the church. And so looking at how they handled it should help us, God forbid, if we face disagreements or questions. This council that happens at Jerusalem is not handled in a way that would have been normal for the culture at the time. Jewish rabbis and Gentile philosophers alike were taught to sharply debate publicly, and winners were those who simply had the best arguments. That's not what happens at this council. It's not a debate and that, man's, um, that man's ability to argue nor popularity might carry the day. Rather, it is a valid attempt to discern the will of God, and that's the task of the church in any age. I'm grateful for Toby Thompson, who is going to help us understand the kinds of information that might have been shared at that council, and we'll be speaking from a Jewish perspective. <laughs> so It begins with, in verse 5, when the gauntlet is thrown down, then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. 
In verse 6, we learn that the participants in the conversation are the apostles and the elders of the church. But as we'll read later, everyone was allowed to remain present so that they together might hear those arguments and learn together how to discern the will of the Lord. So Toby, what might have been an opening argument? Well, the first thing we learn is that the purpose of the law, that was to reveal man's utter sinfulness, his inability to save himself and his desperate need for a savior. The law was never intended to be the way of salvation. All the law could do was to show man what sin was. The law has condemned each of us since no one can keep the whole law. Yet the law was a tutor, which by showing us our sins, escorted us to the seed which was promised to Abraham, which was Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Brothers and sisters, as you know, the law required many sacrifices. Each of those sacrifices pointed to the costliness of sin, and it made clear that a blood sacrifice was necessary in order to bring us into right relationship with God. Think about it. Those sacrifices had to be made daily for us, the Jews, and then each Jew had to bring a sacrifice at certain times of the year or whenever we sinned, even unintentionally. Once a year, our high priest would go into the Holy of Holies to offer the blood of a sacrifice in order to seek forgiveness for the entire nation that we might live together in relationship with a holy God. Those sacrifices made clear that only blood would accomplish those purposes. And the need to offer them so often made clear that it was only a temporary solution. We believe that it is the blood of Jesus Christ which accomplished that once for us once and for all. That we're forgiven for our sins and made right with God through Jesus Christ alone. In regard to the law, we have to see the truth. When we went down under the waters of baptism in Jesus' name, we died and we are in effect then dead to the law. The law doesn't have any power over dead people. When we come up out of those waters, we're raised to new life in Jesus Christ, and it's his life in us that makes us able to live in relationship with God. His life in us that helps us to grow more and more like Jesus. Not our obedience to the law or even duty, but the life of Christ in us. It's by placing our faith in Jesus that we are both justified and sanctified. If not, then why did Jesus have to die? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. That's Genesis 15, verse 9. We know this verse, but what did God say that Abraham believed? God told Abraham that one from his own body would be heir. That promised seed would be named Isaac. Abraham looked into the night skies and God promised descendants he could not count. Abraham was way past the age of fathering a child. His wife, Sarah, was barren. But God is faithful. And despite the whispers and the mocking of being childless, Abraham believed God. Paul uses his Old Testament scripture as an illustration of faith over and against works. When God promised Abraham that he would be a blessing to all nations, Paul brought that same good news to the Gentile churches. Sinners are justified by faith, not by keeping the law. The logic here is evident. If God promised to save the Gentiles by faith, then the Judaizers are wrong in desiring to take the Gentile brethren back into the law. The true children of Abraham are not those Jews by physical descent, but Jews and Gentiles who have believed in Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith. Absolutely. These are the kinds of arguments that would have transpired, not arguments, but rather comments that would have been made at that council. I'll offer one last thought. Our attempts to obey the law have not allowed us to live in relationship to God over many years, circumcision or not. We're simply not able to live holy lives on our own. Peter, you know what you were like. Paul, you know what you were like. I know who I was, and as Toby has said, he knows who he was. The prophet Jeremiah prophesied a new covenant, one in which God would put his law in our minds and write it on our hearts. And this is what happened when Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to live in us. That's what makes everything different, the Spirit living in us. We're not the same people who we are, who we were, pardon me, we're new creations. Think of it this way. 
The church, too, is a new creation. As Jesus said, we are the called out ones. We're not Jewish. We're not Gentile. Nor can we live in the ways that we used to live with the spirit of Jesus Christ living in all of us. So there really can't be any wall between us. Rather, we are intended to be one in Jesus Christ. At the conclusion of those, of those arguments, Peter stood up and summarized what he would have to say. Brethren, 10 to 12 years ago, prior to this very assembly, do you not find it strange that the admission of Cornelius and his Gentile friends, uncircumcised then and uncircumcised now, they came into the fellowship of the church, and this was according to the expressed will of God. Why are these Judaizers again questioning how one must come to God? The law could not save the Jew. Why would these folks consider putting a yoke on the Gentiles that they nor their fathers were ever able to bear? I will go one step further. We Jews need to be saved just like the Gentiles. When God saved Cornelius and other Gentiles, he required no circumcision, no law keeping, no rituals. God makes no mistakes. He does not change his mind. If one should ask about verifying the salvation of the Gentile believers, we have witnesses that the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it did for us at Pentecost. And they received the Holy Spirit not by following the law, but by believing God's word. My statement to that household was, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins, not whoever believes and obeys the law of Moses. Our salvation, both Jew and Gentile, shall be based on faith alone. As Peter concluded, Barnabas and Paul shared their ministry among the Gentiles, how it had been confirmed by miracles and signs. Perhaps their conversation included how Elymas had been struck blind when he tried to get in the way of the Roman proconsul, Sergius Paulus, receiving the gospel. How he, maybe he talked about how the doors were open for the gospel in all the Galatian cities that they had just visited. Or how the lame man was healed in Lystra, a Gentile city, the same way one had been healed in Jerusalem. Perhaps how Paul had been saved after being stoned. Story after story about how the Holy Spirit had been at work among the Gentiles. Lastly, James spoke. He summarized all that he had heard and added the words of the prophet, which confirmed God's plan to include those among the Gentiles who would believe as his own. Now we're not told all that he spoke, but those things might have included Isaiah 42, 6, which reads, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and light for the Gentiles, listen to this, to free captives from prison and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Those were words spoken by Jesus as the reason that he came. Or, for example, Malachi 1.11, my name will be great among the nations in every place. Incense and pure offerings will be brought to my name because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. James concluded his argument, though, with words from the prophet Amos, words that assured Israel that when their Messiah returned, as Jesus had promised to do, he would indeed sit on David's throne in a restored Israel, and the entire world would indeed be led to seek him. James would speak, brethren, listen closely. The God who chose us as a special people unto himself is doing a new thing. Peter has opened the door for the Gentiles, and Barnabas and Paul are sowing the seed even now. God is using them so he can take out of this work a people for his name. How do we know that? The prophets point to a time when Gentiles will seek the Lord our God. This is God's plan and we should not oppose it, lest we be found to be fighting against God. My sentence in conclusion is that we shall not place the yoke of Moses' law upon the Gentile believers. I believe that we should require four things from their pagan, idolatrous practices. That would facilitate unity and common courtesy from our Gentile brethren. Number one, pollution of idols. We know that idolatry is forbidden by God in the Ten Commandments, 
But the Gentiles, they offer their sacrifices, their best animals to their pagan gods. And the gods who were spiritual would eat the spiritual animal. Cleverly, the sacrificer would reclaim that meat and would sell it at the market for the best price. It was already offered to idols. This was the best play to, place to buy your T-bones and your sirloins by the Gentiles. Every, knew, every Jew knew God's command about idolatry. If a Gentile brother invited a Jewish Christian over for a meal and served a sirloin steak purchased at the meat market, how offensive would that be to man raised under the law? Would they think that the Gentile brother had resorted to idolatry again? Number two, they should abstain from fornication, meaning sexual immorality in, in general. The typical Gentile took sexual sins as a common everyday occurrence. The Gentiles are now to live as being holy, being transformed by the Holy Spirit. They are to live as servants of the living God, leaving their carnal desires behind. And number three and four are things strangled and from blood. God spoke to Noah way back in Genesis, verses 9 through 4. The blood was symbolic of life. God commanded us never to eat the blood. It was to be poured onto the ground and covered. Later in Leviticus, the blood of a sacrifice was to be offered at the altar of burnt offerings. For those that were strangled, those animals are snared and strangled, have not been killed and bled properly. Jews find this especially offensive. And the meat is tainted over the blood, not being drained properly. So, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and with much prayer, I proclaim that in the unity and fellowship of believers, both Gentile and Jew should not cause the other to stumble in these matters. The Lord has called both Jew and Gentile to become one. And we shall be united in spreading the good news to the ends of the earth, and let the assembly say, Amen. Amen. If you've ever wondered why we read so many of these arguments all the way through the New Testament, is for purposes such as this. They were trying to comprehend what the move of God looked like. If you want to read more, read through Galatians, um, the book of Hebrews, Ephesians 2. You'll find more in each of those places about these very things. At the conclusion of the council, the decisions were put in letters to be dispersed to all the churches. Special envoys, ambassadors of reconciliation themselves, were sent to Antioch to assure the church there of God's acceptance and the truth of the gospel that they had been taught by Paul and Barnabas. Now this was clearly a council with a single purpose, discerning the will of God. It's that focus which kept the church in unity together and working in love. As a church, as we face questions like those, there are some things that we might be able to discern from it and, and how to move forward together. For example, there's not a vote taken. Rather, everyone is heard, and then there is a summation of all of the evidence with one single purpose, to discern the will of God. Second, the focus is on where we can see God at work, recognizing the movement and confirmation of his presence. Third, they were careful to address all the questions, not just the ones that were spoken. Fourth, they connected all of the evidence to Scripture. The law says this, the prophets say this, Jesus said this, and this is how it all fits together because God is changeless. And fifth and finally, the resulting decrees brought glory to God because it allowed everyone to see what God was doing and to join in that work joyfully. It also brought glory to Jesus Christ because it knocked down walls of division, bringing unity to his church, which is what Jesus said was the way people would recognize that God had truly sent him. And lastly, it points to the work of the Holy Spirit within us, the Spirit of Christ, which makes us one. Now for you this morning, a far more important question might be, do you know the grace of Jesus Christ? Because there's nothing that we can do to earn salvation. It is through faith alone. And that grace is available to you. Um, Brian and Andrew are going to sing for us. And then we'll close with a prayer. But if you have questions, you call. Sinner's restless heart You leave 
us by still waters into mercy and nothing can keep us apart so remember your people remember your children remember your promise oh God your grace is enough your grace is enough your grace is enough and justice God of Jacob you use the weak to lead the strong you lead us in the song of your salvation and all your people sing along so remember your people remember your children remember your promise oh God your grace is enough your grace is enough your grace is enough for me your grace is enough your grace is enough is enough for me. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. His grace is enough for everything that we will ever need. It's that grace that saves us, that grace that invites us. If you don't know that grace today, there's no better place to start than right now. May the presence of Christ go before you. May he be the author and finisher of your faith. Amen.